Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. In this video today, we're going to explore the hydrological cycle. So if we first of all introduce ourselves to this key geographical word, hydrological cycle. And if we are to break this word down into maybe three parts, consider what it means to you. So when I think of the word hydro, I associate it with a word similar such as hydrate. And when we hydrate ourselves, we have to drink water. When I think of the word logical, I'm thinking about something being put into a sequence or an order and following a certain pattern. And then for me, when I think of cycle, I think of something flowing, some type of movement from one thing to the next. And what we basically have here, the hydrological cycle is a more advanced term for the water cycle. The hydrological cycle or the water cycle basically tells us the journey water and water particles make in terms of their journey through the Earth's surface to the atmosphere and back again to the Earth's surface. NASA actually describes the hydrological cycle as a gigantic system powered by energy from the sun. It is a continuous exchange of moisture between the oceans, the atmosphere and the land. And if we were to think about the hydrological cycle and this flow of water within this cycle, we have stores of water and flows of water. And the hydrological cycle transfers water particles in a solid, liquid or gas from your stores of water to your flows of water. Now, your stores of water are where the particles maybe a gas, a liquid or a solid, stay in that state for a period of time. So that could be, for example, in the ocean or the sea or a river. It stays as a liquid form for a certain period of time. That is a store of water. A flow of water is when it moves from one state to another and it might change state or stay the same state. So for example, when we heat water up from the sea, it will evaporate and it will condense and form a cloud. Now, in order for the water to move whatever state it is in, solid, liquid or gas, from your sea to your cloud, it needs to go through the two flows of evaporation and condensation. So let's take the time to go through the entire process of the hydrological cycle. Let's start off with a body of water. Now, your body of water could be a sea, it could be an ocean, it could be a river, it could be a lake, it could be a puddle. It just needs to be a store of water that is kept in that same place and in that same state, in this case liquid, for a period of time. Over time, as this system is driven by the energy from the sun, the sun will send solar radiation to that body of water and it will start to heat it up. What we then have is this store of water starting to transfer into a flow of water through the process of evaporation. So in this particular example, the sea, this body of water, is being heated up so much that the water particles are turning from a liquid into water vapour, which is known as a gas, through the process of evaporation. As this water vapour begins to rise into the atmosphere or the sky, it will cool and begin to form condensation. These water droplets are beginning to cool down because they're leaving the Earth's surface where the solar radiation is the most concentrated and warm. And that is why when you go on aeroplanes, for example, it is always a little bit colder because you are high in the atmosphere. The process of condensation then starts to join these water particles together, which then eventually, when collecting enough, will form clouds. So clouds, in this case, is your next store in the hydrological cycle. When these clouds get large enough and the water vapour becomes too much for the clouds to hold, the cloud will eventually give out precipitation. And precipitation can be in the form of rain, it can be hail, it could be sleet, it could even be snow. With precipitation being our next 
flow in the hydrological system, it will mean that obviously this water vapor in a liquid or maybe even a solid state in this case will begin to reach the Earth's surface again. And it has three different options when it reaches our Earth's surface. For one, it could come into contact with trees and plants, which would actually maybe hold and collect some of this water in the hydrological cycle. Alternatively, if you ever yourself have stood under a tree when it is raining, trees provide great interception, which is basically like a big umbrella that will stop the precipitation from hitting the ground. So it will collect maybe on the leaves of the trees, so it is intercepted. When these water droplets or this liquid will actually hit the leaves, it might stay on the leaves of the plants or the trees for a period of time. So they are sometimes known as stores of water and they might even themselves have evaporation uh, from the leaves. The water might heat itself up from the energy from the sun and it might go back into the atmosphere. And we call that transpiration, this idea of evaporation from the leaves of the tree. Okay, so we've got another flow there. Now, if the precipitation does not come into contact with trees or plants, it might instead come into contact with the ground surface. So if we have precipitation falling to the ground, it might be that it comes into contact with tarmac or concrete or a road or a driveway. Unfortunately, these types of materials are known as impermeable. They will not let the water particles form or infiltrate or go into them. They are impermeable, which means that the water has no other choice but to run over the land surface known as surface runoff and this water might lead itself into drain pipes if it's in an urban area if it is in a rural area it might collect in a lake or go to a river but eventually it's going to lead back to a body of water a river a sea an ocean through surface runoff Alternatively, this precipitation could actually fall onto ground which is permeable, such as clay, sand, grass. What this type of surface will do is allow the water to infiltrate, to soak into it like a sponge. So this permeable ground will actually absorb some of the water from the precipitation and it will allow it to filter into the ground through the process of infiltration. This also means that soil and rock particles and sand are actually a store of water. If you yourself have ever walked on grass after it has rained, you might notice sometimes that the water comes up through the soil back to the surface of the grass. And that is because the precipitation in the water, the liquid is being held in the soil as a store. Now, once this water has infiltrated the ground, it might choose to do a number of things. It might stay in the soil, it might stay in the grass, it might be absorbed by some trees, it might choose to evaporate from the ground surface if the sun and the temperature is warm enough, but it also might choose to what we call percolation. Percolate means to move through the ground. It might move through the soil particles and rock particles deeper into the ground surface. And if this water actually travels deep enough, it will eventually hit what we call groundwater. Water stored deep in the earth's surface just because the water has infiltrated and percolated all these materials. Eventually, the groundwater will actually, it's not static, it's not stable, it can move. So this groundwater might do what we call through flow. So this water might then flow through the surface of the ground, the groundwater deep below the surface of the earth, and eventually go back to a body of water. So in conclusion, this entire system and diagram you see on the screen now is the process 
of the hydrological cycle. The shift and transfer of stores of water in a solid, liquid or gas state flowing to another store of water, potentially changing states from a liquid to a solid or a gas to a liquid, flowing round this system driven by the energy from the sun. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in my next video.